Listen, the gospel is amazing. The gospel wants to teach you who you are. It doesn't just call you to a bunch of rules or call you to something. It, the finished work of Jesus is designed to teach us the truth about who we've always been. We just didn't see it. Forgive them, Father. They know not what they do. That means there's a blindness on people that they're doing things because they don't even know who they are. Because they're thinking wrong. Their thinking is twisted. The word perversion means twisted. We always think sexual when we hear the word perverted or pervert. It means twisted. The root word of perversion, it's twisted. You get twisted, a perverse generation, a twisted-minded people. Okay? So, so the gospel teaches you to deny yourself, to not love your own life unto death. If you save your life, you're going to lose it. If you lose it for his name's sake, you find it. Come on, this thing's not complicated. It's really simple, but it's so powerful. Come on, if you find your life, you'll lose it. If you lose your life for his name's sake, you'll find it. That means we aren't living the life we were created for. And that means you can't just bring him into your life. You have to give him your old life. You have to die to everything you've been. Die to your motives, your reasoning, your intellect. That human thing that we all live by, that self-centered, self-focused, self-defending, self-protecting thing. You got up and you shared that prophetic word about unbelief, not correcting it a bit. It was, it was good. And he said, some of you in the end, I love the way you ended it. You know, you said, look, God's done this. God's done this. Man, I, I don't doubt anymore. You know, I believe. And, 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 and unbelief is, is, is a very real part of a lot of our lives. I think another part, there's parts that, that, that God wants to remove. So when he addressed that, he's addressing the, the issue of unbelief. It says in the Bible, they've all heard the gospel, but some some it didn't profit them because they didn't mix it with faith. They, they hardened their heart in unbelief. So unbelief's a real thing. What was going through me when you were doing that was the lack of understanding. There's a lack of understanding in our lives. We're destroyed for the lack of knowledge. We always think it's the devil. Sometimes we blame it on the orchestration of God or the administrative nature of God we think we have him picture him as he's up there calling the shots every day and everything that's unraveling is because of him there's people being destroyed for the lack of knowledge let's get the knowledge destruction can stop Proverbs says in all you're getting get understanding so understanding is a real big deal you grew up I grew up hearing what you don't know won't hurt you it's a flat out lie yeah, that's right. We were taught by a language that's not in this book. Yeah. You were taught what you don't know won't hurt you. You've heard that phrase. I don't care what generation you're from. You've heard that phrase. You heard phrases like don't get your hope up and what you see is what you get. The Bible teaches the total opposite Amen. of all those things we grew up yeah. hearing. Yeah. God helps those who helps themselves. That's not a scripture. <laughs> <laughs> Who's heard these things growing up? Is it, yeah, it found its way here, right? Yeah. You made your bed. No, he made you a brand new bed. He gave you new life. When you're sincere and you repent, you don't reap what you sowed. You reap what he sowed, what he produced. You step into him. You walk in what he accomplished. His life, his nature, his wisdom, his will comes inside of you when you get born again. You don't just say yes to a theology. You don't just embrace a doctrine. His life comes inside of you. Yeah, that's, that'll make you steady Eddie right there. I like that. I'm going to go with Eddie. He's steady. You know what attracted our lives when people were consistent. You know God is faithful. There's no turning or shifting of shadow. He loved you today. He'll love you tomorrow. When you have a theology that doesn't have God consistent, you can't really know him. You'll never draw near to him. You'll run from him. If he's inconsistent in your belief, if he's mad at you today, if you didn't please him today, if you displeased him today, 
come on, while you were yet a sinner, he sent his son. It didn't say he was at wit's end and so frustrated with humanity that he finally sent his son. He was looking at your life. He knew what he created you to be. He knew what you were called to and called for and here for. He knows the same truth from the beginning is the same truth today. Forgive them, Father. They don't know what they're doing means they're blind and deceived and don't understand. But we walk in the light. We are the light. And we're here from the beginning. And we understand. We know who they are. And they're worth this to me. That's powerful. Come on, that's the gospel. That's not just to get you to say yes to and nod your head and go under some water and come out. So when the roll's called, you're on the roll. Come on. It's amazing what we turned this gospel into. Some beneficial, self-serving thing instead of a transformation of our lives. So who he is comes alive in us and the Christ in us, the hope of glory. Yeah? The gospel wants to get in you and change your perspective, your motive, your reason for being and show you that the way you were living is just some other way, but he's the way. He's the way. He's the truth. He's not our truth. He's the truth. I feel like my life has been extremely consistent and steady. And that's what people that know me, that have known me from the time I got saved. They say, he's the same Dan. He's just a little more passionate and he loves Jesus a little more. And he's a little more crazy when he preaches at times because he's been with him. And, you know, you can't suppress the passion. I don't put on a jacket to preach and impress you. He's impressed me. Yes. Like when you've been with him, yeah. then you're not just talking about him. Yeah. <laughs> when you've known him, you're not just talking about one you've read about. You can't control the passion. People say, tone down. You're wrong about that. Tone down. These things are real. This is amazing. He paid for this. Paid for what? To put his life inside of us and change where we live from. And in that, he changes everything. The why behind my life. If he can change the why in our life, the motive that you wake up in, the motive that you walk through your day in. If he can just get inside you and tweak your motive and change the why behind your life. Dramatically changes everything. everything. If you wake up and people owe you something, you're going to live disappointed. You're going to live frustrated. You're going to live very self-conscious and very people conscious. But if you wake up and no man owes you anything, you just wake up and nobody owes you a thing because he gave you his kingdom. And without full communion, that first sang, song we started singing, without full communion, co-union, intimacy with God, I am unfulfilled. So if I'm unfulfilled without full communion, there's nothing else that can fulfill me. Because it's Ephesians 3. It's scripture. It's not just a song. It's Ephesians 3. It says to know the love of Christ. To know the love of Christ, which passes knowledge. To know the love of Christ, which passes knowledge, is to be filled with all the fullness of God. We're filled with all the fullness of God. Sure doesn't sound like empty. Doesn't sound like deficit. Doesn't sound needy. Sounds wanting for nothing. I looked up the word fullness. I studied it out a little bit. It means a house with no empty rooms. It means a town with no empty houses. Must be the body of Christ. Not church attendance body of Christ. Yes. There's a difference yes. between going to church and being Christ-like. Yes. 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 Christianity is not church attendance. Christianity yes. isn't serving a doctrine. Yes. Christianity is becoming a life yes. that you live that's in him because he's in you. Yes. So when you're just angry, frustrated, argumentative, discouraged, disappointed, jealous, they're all warning signals. That you're on a wrong track and you're puffed up in knowledge. Yes. Not edified in love and built up in the spirit of God. Yes. The Bible actually teaches if you love, there's one reason. First John 4, 7. There's one reason. If you love, it's because you know him. Amen. And the next verse says if you don't love, there's one reason. Not one of two. Not one of three. Not one of five. One reason. If you don't love, you don't know him. 
He didn't say you don't go to church. He didn't say you're not sincere. He didn't say you don't see your need for a savior. He didn't say you were never sincere and didn't repent and get water baptized. He said, if you don't love, there's one reason you don't know him. So eternal life isn't a prayer that takes you to heaven. Eternal life is that you might know him. See, it's all scripture. It's so solid. Somehow we preached eternal life, a passport to heaven, instead of a relationship with God where you're intimate with him, where who he is becomes the expression of who you are. What would you say, man? One of the last things recorded that he prayed. That they be one as you and me, Father, are one. Then the world will know you sent your son. What's he talking about? He's talking about love. He's talking about will, intent, and purpose. When they become one like we're one, then the world's going to what? Going to know. That you sent your son. Whew. He didn't say when you all attend a service. I'm not being smart and mad and mean with you right now. I'm glad you're here. I'm glad I'm here. We're here to teach, train, equip, to corporately celebrate him, to be edified and, and let God flow like he flowed and let people be encouraged like I feel like we're encouraged. But you come here to keep gaining understanding, stay focused and get stirred up in love and good works. You don't come here to qualify. He qualified you. You don't come here to be accepted. You already are. You come here to know him more and to see that there's people running the race and lock arms and realize he's raising up an army and that you're not the only one. You're never Elisha in a cave. God's doing something on the earth and he's getting us into a place of oneness where there's a true unity of faith, a unity of faith. A unity of faith. What's that mean? That doesn't mean you all go to the same place on Sunday. It means you all live for the same reason. You live to manifest his image. You live to walk in love. You live to follow Jesus. See, some of us disagree on giftings and the way we water baptize and full immersion, sprinkle, name of Jesus, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, all this stuff. And if you were the devil, if you were the devil, you're not. But if you were, you'd mess with the belief system of every person that says they believe and try to get them to fight over what they believe and disagree and miss the heart of God along the way and build their own things and do it from all the wrong places and produce nothing but your own rightness. <sighs> because we're called to be one. The unity of faith. The unity of faith. Watch this. You can believe in sprinkling. You can believe in fully immersion. You can still walk in the unity of faith. You can still walk in love and keep your heart guarded because your heart, out of your heart flows issues of life. You can still keep yourself through prayer and through understanding from being disappointed and discouraged and self-focused and self-centered. And you can lay down your life and give Jesus to everybody in your life. Yeah. You can still make peace. You can still show mercy. You can still cover a multitude of sin with love. You can still let mercy triumph over judgment. You might believe sprinkling and you might believe total immersion. You can still walk in love. But it's amazing how we prove we really don't know him. When we don't agree on the latter and can't walk in love. And then it's a giveaway that we're puffed up in our own knowledge when it's love that in fact edifies. So it doesn't matter who's right and who's wrong. It matters who's being like him. Because as he is, so are we in this world. And as the Father sent me, so I send you. And the things I do, you'll do if you believe. Firstborn among many brethren, predestined to be conformed to his image. There's a few scriptures that make us one with him. Yet we grow up in church, we learn what we learn at church, somebody else learns something else, and we think we're enemies. And then somebody's excited and fired up, and we're more worried about their doctrine than the, where their heart is right now. And then we can't even hear because we're already on guard, because we already believe we're right. And next thing you know, there's animosity, and two Christians can't even talk because they're from different arenas. And there's more contention. I personally don't have that problem, whether I'm on a plane, talking to somebody on the street. I've had people get, but I'm not here to fight you. I'm not going to fight with you. 
If, if you're going to fight with me and I'm sitting on an airplane with you and you just want to fight over religion, I've had a few times where people were totally in the moment, unreachable. So what do you do? This is what I wanted to get on tonight. It's not going to be deep to some of you. The gospel's simple, but I'm telling you, it's profound and life-changing. You, you, you sow seed and you don't misunderstand the amazing God principle of sowing seed of maintaining your disposition, of not getting back into the fight. It takes two to tango, one to pursue peace. And you trust that at the end of that conversation, even though it was one-sided and full of aggression and put down and belittlement, boom, 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 that you responded well in your heart. And you trust that God would take that one little seed of your own disposition that you've sown in through the understanding you have with him that you're not in a fight against one another. He, this man, is not my war. My war is not flesh and blood. It's not doctrinal disagreement. He is not my enemy. He's not Satan in the flesh. And he has no ability, and this is a big one, to hurt my feelings. Because he doesn't owe me anything. I already know who I am and I'm secure in that truth. So I'm just having the time of my life. So whether he agrees me or, or not, or I agree there, I can still walk in love. I can still hear the Lord. I can still pray for the sick. I can still bless. And usually in those situations, there's one I'm thinking of specifically where it didn't happen. And we just ended a certain way. And right before we got off the plane, I said, listen, man. I, and I wasn't rhetorical. I was sincere as could be. And no intentions of, and I'm sorry if, and I just want you to know, man, I love you and want the best for you, and I'm glad I met you. God bless you. And I gave him a big hug. That's the best I could do. I was listening for a word of knowledge. I was listening for inside scoop stuff. Because if your heart's pure, God will give it to you. Now, if you just want to do it to upstage, you ain't hearing nothing, and you'll make something up and be wrong, probably. <laughs> but the excellent way is love. And God can tell himself anything. So if I become one with his heart and motive, I'm in. You can't believe how many times, like with Christians, with people that aren't Christians, you don't have a problem. They see your sincerity. They're not questioning your doctrine. They didn't grow up in another circle. (laughs) So that's why people say unbelievers are so much easier to talk to than confessing Christians. That's why people say that. And it seems true on the surface. But what I believe for when I'm with Christians that have those things, I just believe for word of knowledge. I just believe that God will just expose things, not bad, sinful stuff. Just, well, listen, man, I know there's been a pressure in your finances. I keep feeling like you just recently lost your job. Are you looking for that? How do you know that? The one we're talking about. He just showed me the Lord's so good. He loves you, man. Wait, how did you? Because he goes to a church that doesn't believe in the gifts. So rather than theologically discuss it for two hours on the plane, why not just demonstrate it? Freak him out. Get him trembling before the Lord. And then grab his hand and pray and his presence comes and now you got him. And all of a sudden God's a lot more real than he was. That sure beats an argument for two hours. An argument in disguise. You know, calm argument where all you're doing is debating scriptural differences. It's a zero. Stay out of it. Nobody ever wins. It's a zero. But sowing seed is a big deal. It's just what I was hearing when you were up sharing. And when you were sharing about world changing stuff. Sometimes, and I'm not putting any of it down. It's all powerful. Look, if you walk into Walmart and everybody falls on the floor and screams, fire, I'm on fire. That would be a good day. (laughs) But I think that's sometimes what we picture. And we feel so far removed from that. So he says this phrase, what about me? See, I paid attention in the service. Can you tell I paid attention? (laughs) What about me? Well, see, when you say, what about me? You you know, it would be amazing to see blind eyes, seeing all that stuff that we talk about with Jesus' life and as he is, so are we in this world. But you don't even understand maybe that where he quoted that in the text that that's written, the whole thing's about him being love. So when we hear those scriptures, we think power. And I know a lot of people pursuing power without his heart. And it's dangerous because then any way God flows through you is where you'll find your identity, your zeal, and your momentum instead of his heart and his love. 
So you want to be careful with that. You don't want your gifting to identify you. You don't want to find your momentum through your gifting. You don't just want to be used by God. You want to become more and more like him as much as possible by the spirit of grace that's upon our lives. What's it matter if you're reading everybody's mail and you're frustrated with your own spouse and in unforgiveness and shouting her down when nobody's looking? But you're reading everybody's mail. All you are, friend, is gifted, but you're proving you don't know him, but the gifts are without repentance. You're a son way before you're a prophet. You with me? I've watched this thing in my life as a pastor. People get their identity through the way God uses them instead of the way they've become in him. And we mark each other for the grace and gift on their life instead of the heart they walk in. Because if you don't understand this, even your gifting will become a trap to you. The enemy will just cut down who you are if he can't touch the gift. Just push a few people buttons in your life and break your heart. But you can still hear the voice of the Lord prophetically. But your heart's broken, you're hurt, you're offended, you're angry. And then what people do is they separate the two and say, oh, well, see, God uses weak vessels. God uses dirty vessels. God uses broken vessels. Hey, we're just. So then it tells people, hey, this is who we are. Thank God he still uses us. Yeah. <laughs> it's flat out deception. Yeah. I mean, come on. <laughs> I'm not preaching legalism and it's not works and it's not perfection. I'm preaching purity of heart. And the pure in heart shall. It's a big deal to let the gospel purify your heart. That when you wake up in the morning, the why behind your life is to pursue his image, his presence, and walk in his love and live by his spirit. To actually purify your heart to where you, in prayer, settle that nobody owes you anything today. Therefore, nobody can break your heart because you didn't wake up to get anything from anyone. You don't need an encouraging word. You're encouraged in him. That way, if somebody gives you an encouraging word, it's healthy. And it just adds synergism to the momentum that's in your heart. When you need a thank you, it's not healthy to be thanked. It's healthier to reevaluate your heart and wonder why you need to thank you when what you do is walked out by love. Nobody owes you anything. Love, you don't, nobody owes you anything in love. You don't owe no man anything but to love. You lay down your life. Love doesn't seek it. So when you're serving in a ministry and have a need to be appreciated, that's a problem. That's an easy target. You don't need to be appreciated. You've got to reevaluate. You're serving in a church, in a ministry, and you start feeling like people don't notice what you're doing. Time to, that's warning. You're not doing it to be noticed. If you're doing it to be noticed, back out of the ministry and get a better grip on your motive. Or you're going to be another hurt person that goes to church, probably another one. Yeah. <laughs> You all right? Good. You seem like you guys are really good. You really do. Come on, this is simple stuff. Power so and seed. When you're talking about world changer stuff, my heart's spinning over there. I'm going, whoa. You see, what about me is really answered simply in the power, the kingdom dynamic of sowing seed. You, you, you say, well, I'm not this kind of personality. I'm not this. Listen, everybody can sow seeds of love. Everybody can be sincere and sow seeds of faith. Everybody in this room can guard your own heart. And, and if you couldn't, he wouldn't ask you to. Every one of us can follow Jesus or he wouldn't invite you in. But what we think following Jesus is, is walking down the street and everybody that's hobbling is walking straight because you walked by. That's what we picture. No, we do. We run highlight clips. We run the best things we've ever seen, try to blow each other's mind and set something up here that people feel like they can never reach. And then they fail to just walk in the everyday seed sowing kingdom reality of just being genuine, upright, walking in love, being sincere and being like Jesus. Woo. 
Because that steady Eddie thing, I know we're joking about it, but it's true. When your coworkers see steady Eddie, yeah. instead of following Freddie or whatever. <laughs> now, if your name's Fred, I didn't prophesy over you. But steady Eddie is a little more solid than faltering Freddie. Because the best thing to say is, oh, well, yeah, he goes to church. Unbelievers use your inconsistency to relieve their own convictions and their own consciences. Now, I'm not talking about works here. I'm talking about you living by the Spirit. I'm talking about you waking up in the morning and understanding that you have this blessing in life called a mission field, your sphere of influence. You're going to walk in the light as he's in the light. And you're going to let your light so shine before men without being overwhelmed, pressured. You're just the why behind your life is settled. I'm going to work to shine. I ain't going to work to be treated fair. I ain't going to be to work for, to find favor. I ain't going to work for the boss and pray that the boss treats me right. Don't matter how the boss treats me. I'm going to be like Jesus. See, you can't touch that. And if you don't understand that, then the whole time you're using your faith to pray for another job to run from what you can't walk through. And you think that's Christianity. And then all you want God to do is just give you favor every day and get you to put all the people around you that suit you instead of challenge you. You don't need a new job. You need to shine right where you are if that's the reason you want to leave. I'm not saying you don't need a new job all the time. Sometimes it's good to get a new job. But, but most people look for a new job because of what they're frustrated with or unsatisfied with. And a lot of times it's people connected. Why do we got to always work beside Johnny? God, please, today, if I work beside Johnny, I'm going to wonder what I did. God, what the door did I open that you, what are you trying to teach me that you gave me a life sentence working beside Johnny? <laughs> that people talk like that to the Lord and call it prayer. <laughs> Lord, why are you letting this happen to me? Why are you doing this to me? What are you trying to teach me, God? What door did I open to let the devil? And it's usually people's stuff. Could you imagine Jesus if he had that perspective and mentality in his life? That would have been some sad prayers. <laughs> What's the matter, Father? These people are wacko. I'm like healing their sick and they're trying to figure out what devil's possessing me. What's wrong with them? Are they that blind? I mean, I know they were blind, but that blind? Like, I'm not feeling much love down here. There's not a whole lot of appreciation. Like, you let me hear their thoughts. Their thoughts are not cool. I wish you'd turn that off. I don't want to hear their thoughts. Could you imagine? I don't think people appreciate me. I mean, I multiply their food and they come back just because they want another meal. <laughs> See, if you don't understand this about Christianity, he said, follow him. He didn't say sing to him and pray to him when you're overwhelmed. He said, follow me. Follow me. Whew. Guys, that's Christianity. Follow him. You don't see him frustrated and discouraged. On the night he was betrayed. He broke bread and passed it and laid down his life. He was about to get struck. They were going to scatter the people he invested his life into. In today's Christendom, that's a hurting pastor that can't trust people anymore. <laughs> Nobody owes him anything. He's love. You say, well, he did that because he's Jesus. No, he did it because he's love. Don't make him a special man. Figure out who he is. That's what he wants you to follow. You say, well, he is a special man. Oh, I get it. But he didn't do it as Jesus. He laid down as, as, as God. I mean, he laid down his reputation. He laid down his glory. He made himself of no reputation. He was empowered by the Spirit of God. He called himself the Son of Man. God defeated the devil through a man. What man failed, God fulfilled through man. And a man's blood, read your Bible, is on the mercy seat at the right hand. A man's blood. The man. 
Read your Bible. Don't get mad at me. People feel like you're doing Jesus injustice. No, no, no. He came as a man. You know what 1 John 4 says? The spirit that doesn't acknowledge that Jesus came in the flesh is the Antichrist spirit. Why? Because the devil doesn't ever want you and me to understand the power of him coming as a man. He didn't come as God. He came as a man. And we feel like we have to still make him God. God anointed Jesus of Nazareth. A man. God doesn't have to anoint God. God's anointed. The Spirit of God doesn't have to come upon a man. He is the Spirit of God. If he's God. Yeah? Does God ever slumber? Was Jesus asleep at all in your Bible? Yes. Wow. Can you tempt God? No. He was tempted at all points, yet without sin. He came as a man. Don't get mad at that. Yeah, be just like her. That's right. See, I know what's going on. I feel that way all the time. Yeah. See, when you got the little baby up front going, ah, when you say he came as a man, and the little baby, little baby. What? Three, four, six. six. Oh, I thought she was like four. Six months old. <gasps> Look at you. Oh, I get it. I get it. Yeah, I just get it. Oh, my goodness. Oh, see, unless you become like her. Yes. He's not talking about childish. He's talking about innocence. Watch. Not an ounce of self-consciousness. Not an ounce. Trust, dependency. Not an ounce of self-consciousness. He's not talking about childish. Unless you become childish. Just become like a little child. He didn't say a child. He said a little child. Because it's not long in there where you lose innocence. Where you become self-conscious. Where that lie that we were born into in Adam starts to be prevalent and dominating. When you get laughed at at a young age and you realize they're laughing at you. And then you either become broken and insecure and introverted or hardened and a fighter and jaded. And all of a sudden the laughter is molding you instead of the truth. And all of a sudden at a very young age, you're nothing more than an expression of what you've been through and how you've responded instead of what he created you for. Because we were all born into Adam. And you must be born again. Yes. And somehow we turned that into a self-beneficial prayer that takes me to heaven someday when this thing's a wrap. Instead of becoming the person he created me for and paid for me to become. Christ did us. The hope of glory. Yeah? Yeah. So when you get born again, people, you take all those insecurities, you take all that stuff. You take what your daddy said and didn't say and what so-and-so did and didn't. You take all that and you throw it away in a baptismal. You die to it once for all. You say, man, I am not letting what people didn't see decide what I do see if he's the light of the world. I ain't going to let what I've been through govern my life if what he's been through is where I find life. I'm not going to say, well, you don't know what it was like when I was growing up, brother. You are not growing up. You're 45. Stop. <laughs> Look, I'm not diminishing you. I'm saying stop living by that story. That was all in sin. That was all in life without him. That was all. Why would you take an identity that doesn't come from him? Why would you wear what's not yours? Nobody paid for that. Most people just took something. But when he died, you died. 
When he rose, you rose in him. Time to believe. You're not a little girl that was touched wrong. You're a young woman that was touched right. Restored. Restored and redeemed to truth. You don't have to live by a lie. You weren't a young man that was touched wrong. You're a young man that was touched right. See, we all have stories. We all have go-throughs. We've all got our little stuff. I could tell mine. You could tell yours. I'm not being insensitive. I could tell unfortunate things and probably get a sigh out of you. But then what? So you just feel sorry for me because I've been through hell and then we're going to sing it's all about heaven? Oh, it's true. So we're just going to go around the room and find out who's been through the most hell and then what? Sympathize a little more with them because they were through a little more than us? And then mark them for the hell they've been through instead of the heaven they're created for? And sympathize and feed that thing that can never go away in that identity? Because there ain't enough sympathy that can change nothing. You can't go back and rewrite one page. So the gospel tears them all out. Just says, let's start over and write a new book. And so many people are hung up on writing a book about their former life. Why don't you write some new pages? Why don't you learn what freedom really is and wake up and not be self-conscious? And not feel like, oh, buddy, owes you a thing and you ain't got to make up for nothing. You got one thing to do today. Enjoy him being in you. Enjoy you being in him. You wake up today. You go to work and you purpose to love because you spend time with him. Not complaining, seeking and growing. See, because here's what love is. Love's not a gushy feeling. Just like fullness isn't a feeling. Like, I don't, I don't know. Like, you feel full when you eat. Some people still keep eating. <laughs> but it's like him loving you. It's, so many people are looking to feel that love instead of know that love. Like nothing can take the knowing of the love that I know he has for me through the cross because I've spent time with him. I've communed it. I've acknowledged it. Wow, thanks for loving me. The way you see me is overwhelming. That's incredible that you see me as if I've never sinned. That it's your good pleasure to give me the kingdom and put all that you are inside of me so that I can wake up every day and live my life in you. For those that live by the Spirit won't fulfill the lust of the flesh. I thank you I'm not in a war against my flesh. I'm not fighting the devil, my flesh, or people. I'm fighting the good fight of faith. I'm just walking out what you paid for. Come on, that's the gospel. That's Christianity. It is waking up to shine. Waking up to shine. Not waking up needy. See, when you wake up needy, it's dangerous because then you put your expectations on people. And then somebody doesn't say the right thing or somebody says the wrong thing. And then you're only as strong as the weakness you're surrounded by. That's a bummer. Then we think we need prayer and we think we need ministry. No, we need higher truth. Because truth's going to make you free. Yeah? Just think, if you let the gospel teach you one thing at your age, son, that every day you wake up, nobody owes you a thing. That you're called to wake up and shine. That's so powerful. Let's look at what love is in the Bible. It doesn't seek its own. And because it doesn't seek its own, watch, takes no account. No account what? Of the wrong done to it. Then why have we been so broken up by each other? Why do some of us have that story laid out like it just happened yesterday when it was two years ago? Why do we still identify when we talk with the things that went wrong, the people that did wrong? If the love takes no account of the wrong, why are we so influenced by the wrongs done? And why do we see it so loud and clear? Because if God saw you and me that way, we have no hope. If God saw you and me for the wrong we've done, he sees us for creative value, potential, purpose. He sees you for the life that we were called to and the thing we were created for. That's why God so loved the world. 
You say, how can he love when it's all that sin? He doesn't see the sin. He put the sin on his son. Take away the sin of the world. Get the veil off. Get the lie off. Get the wrong identity off. So you're not even no longer sinners saved by grace. Your son's adopted in. Daughter's adopted in. Where the life and the nature of God lives in you. It's all scripture. Paul didn't write to the sinners of Ephesus. He wrote to saints. And we fight over that thing and fight over that thing and prove that we don't know him like we sing. The way we handle each other when we disagree gives a dead giveaway. Nowadays, social media, nowadays society just write things, just tear people up, share their disappointments in preachers and people take us in and heretic this and they're this and they're that. And I just wonder how many tears are shed for people that you think are that wrong. Because Jesus shed his blood for those very people. So when people just backbite like that, they're a dead giveaway. They don't know the Lord that they're saying they're talking about. Because he doesn't do that. He sends his son and lays down his life. He doesn't write a blog or whatever they call it. I'm not an internet guy, so forgive me, but people just tell me the stuff that people do out there and how quick it is to cast your opinion. And Paul said, don't be wise in it. Your own opinion. Watch this. The Bible says, slow to speak, slow to anger, quick to listen. What have most of us been our whole life? Quick to speak, don't want to hear it, and I'm ticked off. That's a sure sign of the fall of man, perversion. Love lays down its life for another, and most of us have lived at the expense of one another even after we were saved. You cup an attitude in your home that's not life-giving. You put pressure on your family members to have to respond to you as if you're the only one in the world. It's a wrong form of attention. It's living at the expense of others. And you go to church and prove by your life you don't know him like we sing. Come on. You can get mad at that. I feel that in the room a little bit. That's okay. <laughs> Come on, why would you submit to religion? Why would you just be mad at that? Why would you be frustrated that a preacher's talking like that? Come on, if you can know him and your life could be productive and you can live in your house and walk in the light as he's in the light, why would you cop an attitude that doesn't bring life? Amen. If he came to give you life and more, life more abundantly, why wouldn't you pursue that and manifest that? Why would you draw from others at their expense for your gain? Just moody. Just moody. Let's stop calling it normal. Just silent treatments to your spouse. I, I know. I used to do it to mine. She used to do it to me. We weren't always born again. But we're born again. <laughs> oh, I'm telling you, I'm not talking about perfection. And don't get judged by me and condemned by me or try to compare to me. I'm telling you, I'm passionate. Can you see how passionate I am on this topic? Can you see how that gear shifted and I got, I, I got really intense? It's because we sell cheap and think we can't live this way when Christ is in us. Why? Because we're believing the old lie. We're believing what we were taught by instead of the teacher. And he said, don't call anyone on earth your teacher. You got one teacher and he's the Christ. Watch this. And if I can't find it in his life, why is it okay in my life? If I didn't learn it from him, then where'd I learn it? If he's the teacher. It's called the way that seemeth right to a man. Oh, and you can find two offended or two hurting friends to agree with your feelings yeah. and give you permission to stay there. But if it's not producing life, it can't be the Lord. Amen. So I don't need to be right in my family at the cost of truth. Yeah. And you're not going to see me argue with my spouse. It's forbidden territory. That's so ingrained in me, it's not going to happen. You say, you can't say that. Well, I've been saying it for 23 years. Amen. That's long enough time to convince myself. I'm sorry if you're not convinced. You don't live with me. You just see me on weekends. And you might be sitting here and just gave your spouse a good earful on the way here. <laughs> so I understand it's a little uncomfortable. But if we don't challenge you in some things and call some things to the table... Then we continue to just do holy, 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 holy. And then we're mad and have animosity two hours later when we're not in that setting. 
I'd love to challenge that. I'd love you to give yourself no permission to ever live there. And if you catch yourself there, catch yourself out of there real quick. Yeah. 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 Because all the silent treatment is to your spouse, you get familiar with your spouse. See, and you think you know each other, so you just send that body language. So, so, so if you're the guy, you carry yourself a certain way and you got on the face that she's familiar with. As soon as she sees the face, she says, oh. <laughs> and you're hoping she's in a peaceful, merciful mood and she plays into your face. She says, honey, what's wrong? Are you okay? Is everything good? I'm all right. And you just walk by and go right out into the kitchen, open the fridge. So it's control and manipulation. Yeah. Yeah. Watch. Jesus would never, ever live that way. Yeah. And the only reason you're living that way is because you weren't born into him and you were trained outside of him. So let's get new life through Jesus Christ and get fathered from above. Yes. It's called put off the old, put on the new. Yeah. Yes. Come on. I, I, I'm on this thing right now. Are you okay? You guys okay? I'm, no, I'm feeling like this needs addressed. Animosity in our homes to stop winking at it and thinking it's normal and everybody has their moments. No, that's why you have yours because you believe that. Why don't you be the steward of your own heart? Not theirs. It takes two to tango and I'm not talking about dancing. It takes one to pursue peace. And blessed are the... Sounds like a good place to be. Blessed. Blessed are the... For they are the sons of God. So sonship's not a confession. It's not a new language in the church. Sonship's an expression. It's a life we live because of what we've become. So you love one... <laughs> you done captured my heart a long time ago. <laughs> She just, she's like, I don't even know what you're talking about, preacher. I'm just so loved, and I love everybody, and I just got joy in my heart. I ain't thought a bad thought in my little life. Six months of innocence. That's a gift right there. Oh, my goodness. And you're right in the front row. She's kicking her leg. <laughs> I just want to bite her. <laughs> Do you ever feel that way? It doesn't even sound right, right? It's like, I just want to bite her. <laughs> oh, I'll be good. I ain't going to bite you. Yeah. <laughs> oh, look at that. Her little body language, see, it gives her away. See, your body language, you give you away in your family, right? They say, oh, keep your distance. You know how we teach ourselves that stuff in our families? Yeah. Keep your distance. Her mommy comes into the kids. Just leave daddy alone for a while. Just leave daddy alone. That's not cool if she has to tell the kids that and you're ushering. Because all you're doing without realizing it is you're sending a message to your children that Christianity is nothing more than church attendance. It certainly is in Christ-likeness. That's the message you're sending without even realizing it. Because in that moment, you're right and you're mad. Well, I thought you were surrendered and dead to yourself and alive unto God. Yes, so I thought you were a Christian. Yeah. <laughs> Is it okay to talk this plate? Are you guys okay? Yeah. Or do you want me to like say something? I couldn't say something, Rosie, and like that not real. This is real. Doesn't matter how well you wave that flag in worship. It matters how you love. Satan could care less. Satan could care less that we're here tonight. In fact, sometimes I think he invokes gatherings. Because he loves to teach religion. He loves when people come to stuff like this and then push his buttons and get you to be all different ways when you leave. And then you look in the mirror and you don't know whether you're coming or going. You're sure not steady, Eddie, and you don't even know if you like yourself, let alone others. He is not threatened because people go to church. He's threatened when they pursue God's image and pursue God's love. He starts showing mercy and making peace and walking in love. When they don't say, well, it's hard to forgive. Give me time. It takes time. When they don't even have a grid for unforgiveness. Because they're so aware of how forgiven they are. That they become the beauty of that same thing that rescued them. And all of a sudden they see men the way God saw them. 
and all of a sudden they don't have issues. They have transformation and change. Yeah. Yeah. That's so See, that's freedom. You don't know freedom until you're free from yourself. Yeah. It's real simple. It's basic. I preach it everywhere I go. God made man for his image. The image died when man sinned. He got separated from God. He got cut off from love. Even though God still loved him, he got disconnected and separated from the source of love. And what was love a second ago became in need of love. Come on. Yeah. This is what happened. It's Genesis 1, 2, 3. It's there. you got to go to the beginning to understand this thing. Because whoever grew up in church wondering why Jesus would go to the extreme of the cross so I could be forgiven and go to heaven. And whoever had more questions about that than an uh, overwhelmed, life-changed heart. Because people said, well, because he loves you. And I'm like, well, why does he care? Like... Why would Jesus come while I'm yet a sinner, die on the cross? I feel like I'm always going to just sin and mess up my whole life anyway. And he did that just to forgive me and send me into his eternal party someday. Why does he even want me in the room? And the best the preacher could say is my whole life. Well, because, they, see, he loves you. But I, nobody ever let me see his first love. They just said, well, he died on the cross because he loves you. He forgave you of all your sin and he wants you to go to heaven. See, he's good. Well, that made me question, like, but I don't even know him. He's, is he even out there? And why would he do that? And in my young heart, I believed he did it. But I'd watch a crucifixion movie at Easter time and wonder, why do you want me in heaven so bad that you would do that? Because he's good, brother. See, he loves. But it was never a love, a revelation that made me go, whoa, and just transform my life. Because watch, he says, if you love me, if you love me, you'll do what I say to do. You'll keep yeah. my commandments. He doesn't say, if you love me, you'll keep my commandments. Right. What he's saying is, if you love me, you'll keep my commandments. Right. Amen. Right. Amen. And nobody loves him first, except they see his first love. So what's the big deal about the cross and his first love? Jesus comes and says, look, I know what I'm paying for. I know what I'm dying for. I'm dying to redeem their destiny, purpose, potential. I want to put my life back in them, put my nature back in them so they can manifest the image. The only reason scripturally a man is on the earth is to be found in God's image. Yes. Yeah. It's the only reason he made man is for his image. He didn't make man just to have fun. He didn't make man because he was bored and lonely. He wanted to multiply himself through flesh so the glory of the Lord could cover the earth so why'd he give you flesh so you could act out and manifest what's on the inside you know them by their see all these principles are still working they just got perverted so there's this war to reproduce after its own kind so God's desire is to reproduce himself after his own kind in you. The enemy's desire is to reproduce himself after his own kind. So we went through all this stuff in the church age with holy hush, tight button, quiet, shh, holy reverence. Couldn't even shout and clap. Demonic if you played drums. Yeah. Yeah. People literally freaked out when somebody played electric guitar. But let somebody pull out in front of you along the road. <laughs> Charismatic worship service right there, buddy. Yeah. Just the wrong one, the wrong God. Yeah. So you go to church, holy hush, reverent. Somebody pull out of you in front of you. You idiot. You might even wave with one finger. <laughs> yeah, be better that way. <laughs> Thank you. Come on. So we're taught all this crazy stuff. It's religious stuff. But it's the enemy's plan. He wants to reduce people made for the image of God, for the similitude of God, and reduce them and make them look like him. He's the only one hopeless. He's the only one that has no chance. There's no redemption for the devil. He loves when human beings believe hopelessness. Get so self-consumed with their circumstances, their situations get so overwhelmed that they have no hope because then they look just like the devil. It's a lie. But there's a natural knowledge surrounding it that qualifies hopelessness. 
and the way that seemeth right to a man is our tutor. And if you have a Christian mentality that it's just about God blessing you and meeting your needs and making your life work and make it to the end, you'll really be swallowed up by those things. If all the gospel is, is a beneficial thing, if the only reason you're a Christian is so life goes better for you, you're in big trouble. Change your motive in Christianity. You're a Christian to shine. The gospel is not a survival kit. It's the answer of a transformed life. Where you live from a new why. Where your motive is totally changed. Where you put off the old man and his deeds. You put on the new man. Listen, Jesus didn't say whoever comes after me and believes on me needs to pray a prayer to assure he's going to heaven. He said, if you're going to come after me, then you've got to deny yourself. You can pray a prayer to go to heaven in total regard for yourself. And all you have is a confession of heaven, but heaven's not flowing out of you. And all of a sudden it's a positional place instead of a life you live. Come on, preacher after preacher after preacher has had this altar call. And I'm not trying to be mean. I'm just saying, what are we doing when Jesus didn't even ever say this? We say, if you leave tonight and you don't know where you're going and you might hit a tree on that road down there and you don't know where you're going to end up if you hit that tree, you need to get that settled now and pray this prayer so you can get your name in that book and go to heaven. And we all go, oh, yeah. Oh, look. Whoa, yay. And everybody's praying a prayer in case they die, they end up in the right place. And we call that the greatest miracle. <laughs> the greatest miracle is when you die and he lives. Yes. When you go to the waters of baptism on the night you get saved or the day you get saved because it was right in the message because it's all about conversion. And you as a witness unto God and men say, I've been living my life for myself. I've been angry, frustrated, jealous, and proud. He never created me for me. He created me for his image. And I want to die to me so I can live to him. I'm going under. And you look bold. You say, preacher, hold me down. Wait till every bubble stops. I got faith. I'm coming up change. <laughs> New life. I know my hair is really white. My beard's almost all white. But that doesn't mean I'm the wisest man that ever lived. I would, I would like to tell you I'm certainly not. But I believe I understand this one thing. The biggest problem on the earth isn't the president. It's not ISIS. It's not racial conflict. The biggest problem on the earth is that every day even church people wake up and live for themselves when they're made for God's image. They pray for themselves. They think for themselves. They give for themselves. Yes. Yeah. Our message is so tied into self-centeredness, it's astounding. Yeah. We're taught to give to get. Yeah. The only reason we cast our bread on the water is because it's going to come back in many days, not many days from now. When do you just give because you give? When do you just lay down your life because you love? Why is it always what you can get instead of what you can become? Why have we reduced the gospel to a survival kit instead of the answer of a brand new life? Yeah. Come on. There ain't one place in the Bible you can piece together two, three, four scriptures and out of the mouths of two or more bear witness of a self-serving gospel. A gospel that just blesses me and gets me a better job and fills my vats and barns. That has never been the gospel from the beginning. The gospel is walking in surrender and integrity and character. And when you don't have enough, nothing changes. You're steady Eddie. Paul didn't have enough at times. It didn't mean he wasn't spiritual. What proved he was spiritual is he didn't let it change him. Come on. Some people have both hands raised because the rent just got paid and they didn't think it was going to. And they are happy in church. But next month, that rent ain't rolled through yet and they're in church. What's the matter? 
just just letting what's going on decide who we are. Letting what That's we're going so through good. decide it. That's so good. Uh -huh. yeah. Yeah. Rendered unproductive, can't reproduce, and lose out on the power of the seed. Yes. And you live from day to day, and you're only doing as good as things are going. That's a reduction and a deception. You ask the average well-meaning Christian how they're doing, they usually tell you the two biggest challenges in their life and say, keep me in prayer. That's the answers you get. Not being mean. I'm not here to correct you. I'm here to tell you who you are and what he paid That's for. Right. Amen. Amen. He said, forgive them, Father. They don't know what they do. And in all you're getting, get understanding. You're destroyed for the lack of knowledge. So you present yourself humble, teachable, and we keep growing up into him in all things. Yeah? yeah. And if that thing that's coming out of your life and that mentality and that motive isn't life-giving and productive, then it needs challenged and removed. But you're the steward of your own heart. You're not the steward of somebody else's heart. You can't let where somebody isn't decide where you are. Come on. You can't let sin against you produce sin in you. You overcome evil with good. Yes. You never repay evil for evil. You don't say, well, I only did that because they started. Well, I wonder, well, how come they, well, I hope you talk to them. Come on. There's a wisdom we were trained by that wasn't from, from the Lord or from the beginning. It's called the wisdom of the world, the wisdom of this age. Are you with me? Yes. And it gives you a permission to be discouraged. It gives you a permission to be self-focused, self-conscious, self-centered. Gives you permission to not walk in love. You have no such permission. Your creative value says, this is what you're here for, to be like him. So here's what makes God so awesome. And this is what I saw when I got saved. It just changed my life forever. I never saw his first love. Everybody tried to tell me it was on the cross. But I didn't get it. And all of a sudden, when I got saved, I was 33. I grew up in church. You say, well, you grew up in church and weren't saved? I went through the motions like a lot of you went through the motions. But I didn't love God. I didn't know God. I didn't seek God. I got baptized at a very young age because if heaven was real, I wanted to go there. I sure didn't want to go to hell. Yeah. You say, well, then, brother, see, you were probably saved. Stop. It's not even a conversation. Stop. It doesn't matter. The goal isn't whether you're going to heaven or hell. The goal is, are you being restored back to what you're here for? Or are you just living your life? The point is not heaven and hell. The, po the point is taking people from the power of Satan to the power of God. Yeah. Yes. And walking in the light as he's in the light. The goal is not heaven versus hell. The goal is being transformed back into what he paid for. Like the cross isn't fulfilled when a man prays a prayer to go to heaven. The cross is paid in full when a man's nature is restored back to love. Yeah. Yeah. But we're so heaven hell minded. Been brainwashed by it, actually. I feel like we've been brainwashed by it from the time we were little. It's just been this big thing over heaven and hell, heaven and hell. And we preach it so much. There's people out there mad because, and then there's like, well, God's going to send me to hell anyway. He's just a controller. He doesn't love me. Well, he knew Adam was going to eat the tree. Why did he put the stupid tree there anyway? See, all this is God's fault. And just, just, just rationale and just human wisdom, just constantly putting God into the court of the mind. If Adam wouldn't eat the tree, you wouldn't even be able to think that way. You wouldn't even be able to have that attitude. You'd see clear. Your heart would be free. But it's just a never-ending debate. It's not heaven and hell, heaven and hell, heaven and hell. It's what are you here for? What would you create it for? Jesus did not say, if any man come after me, make sure he pray this prayer so he doesn't go to hell and my, my heaven's waiting for him. He said, deny yourself. Pick up your cross. That means you won't get treated right sometimes, but you won't let that change a thing. You won't get loved by men sometimes, but you won't change your view of men. You are done reading a book by the cover. There are center chapters with value. You are following Jesus. Your eyes are fixed. You are picking up your cross. You denied yourself. Now you're following him. That's simple Christianity. And we somehow think that's radical. Yeah. 
Because you've been trained your whole life by emotions that flowed out of a self-centered wellspring. Your whole life you were trained by wisdom that didn't come from him. So he says, give your life as you know it so you can find your true life. Come on, this thing is so important. You can't put new into old. How many scriptures have I quoted to back this thing up? A lot if you'd re-listen to this thing. It's all there. It just paints one big beautiful picture. But if you just teach heaven and hell, you can't even preach all these scriptures. My motive for being a Christian is not so I can go to heaven. And it's not so I don't go to hell. That horrifies most Christians when you say that. That has nothing to do with why I'm a Christian. I'm a Christian to become the man that he created me to be and walk in the purpose that he had for me from the beginning and fulfill the blood payment of Jesus Christ in full. Yes. To be the purchased possession of his blood and pay good dividends, the glory of his inheritance in the saints. Not your inheritance, his inheritance. What he gets back from the investment of the blood of Jesus. What he gets back in a return for the deposit of the Son of God. Cool. Yeah? So yeah, to me, my attitude matters. To me, my motive in my home means a lot. To me, the message I send to my fellow man is huge because it's worth the blood of Jesus to put his life in me. You better believe this thing sobers me. And if I love him and see that on my darkest day, he never changed his mind about me. Yeah. That on the night when I said I'm in, he scooped me up and held me. Yeah. Breathe life back into me. We didn't have to talk for three hours and work out details. He put a signet ring on my finger, slippers on my feet, and he threw a party. Because a son came home. Oh. And I know it. He received me in a moment. I live so contrary to him. And he received me in a moment. And this is what he showed me. Dan, I didn't die on the cross because you were a sinner. I had to die because you sinned. I died on the cross because you were a lost son. And I came to save that which was lost. Amen. Amen. I didn't die because you were a sinner. I died because your life has great value to my plan. And I know what you look like when I'm in you and you're surrendered. And that's worth paying for. Yeah. And I started realizing his love could never fail. Because his love doesn't seek his own. So I didn't frustrate God like your parents try to teach you. Well, you just made God really mad. Well, you just broke the heart of God. It's not a good thing to teach your children. Because then they start thinking that God's like you. It's not a good thing. Well-meaning parents. Countless well-meaning parents. Well, you just made the heart of God broken. You just made him angry. Well, God saw that. What are you trying to do to them? Develop a fear, conscious relationship with the Lord. That's not fueled by love. That's fueled by works, which they're destined to fail, so now they're condemned in their heart. You've got to teach people who they are, not what they're doing wrong. You've got to make a tree good, not tell it to change its fruit. If you're going to tell the tree to change its fruit, you probably ought to re-identify the tree. You probably ought to tell people who they are so they can bear fruit accordingly to truth. Come on. You all okay? Well, I'm done. I'm going to quit just because I feel like you guys need me to quit. I feel like I said more than you can almost handle right now. I feel like we are more. Please don't get used to living in the things that don't produce life and keep your heart encouraged. It's a good barometer. If what you're thinking and believing doesn't encourage your heart, it can't be from the Lord. It can't be truth. He came to give you life and life more abundantly. That's not positional. That's your heart encouraged. 
It says, consider him in Hebrews 12, 3. Consider him who endured such hostility against himself from sinners. Least you be weary and discouraged in your soul. That means discouragement is a dead giveaway that you're being deceived. Oh, wow. So if you're discouraged, where's your focus? Who are you focused on if you're living discouraged? On you and how everything's affecting you, what it's putting you through, what it's costing you. Well, if Jesus lived that way, he's pretty bummed out right out of the gate. <laughs> like the first day Jesus preached, they were like, it said all eyes were fixed on him. Can you imagine 40 days in the wilderness, defeated the devil through the word and by the spirit? He takes the scroll and says, the spirit of the Lord is upon me. It was probably like, whoa. And everybody's like, it's as everybody's eyes were fixed on him. They were like, this dude is, whoa. And as he's speaking, they start looking going, hey, is he talking about us? Yeah, it says they perceived he was talking about them. <laughs> A minute ago, they're impressed. They're like, I ain't never felt no authority like this in the room. I never saw no one who carried himself with such a confidence. Whoa. And all of a sudden, wait a minute. He's talking about us. Yeah. What do you want to do? Kill him. <laughs> they went from being all in all of him to ready to push him off a cliff and get rid of him because they didn't like what he was saying. You be careful when you get ticked off at preachers, even when they're wrong, even when their approach is wrong. You be careful. Let your heart be bigger than their weakness. I'm telling you, don't, don't keep letting where people aren't determine where you are. Well, they're just, well, they make me with that loud mouth. Well, he's always trying to tell me what to do. And all of a sudden, he's already controlling your life because you got attitude and it ain't good. So the man's already fashioning you. See, here's what he said. He said, you scribes, you Pharisees, woe to you, woe to you, woe to you, woe to you, woe to you. And at the end, here's what he said. He said, for this reason, all the righteous blood that was shed from righteous Abel. Remember, Cain killed Abel way back in the beginning. Righteous Abel from righteous Abel all the way to Zechariah, the son of Berechiah. He said, whom you killed between the porch and the temple. With the temple and, the and I'm like, wait a minute. You're the Pharisee standing there and Jesus is looking at you and he's serious. He says, for this reason, all the righteous blood that was shed from Abel to Zechariah, the son of Berechiah, whom you murdered. That's what he used, murdered. And he says, and I looked it up. It was 700 years before. And he's pointing to them saying, you murdered him. What he's saying is it's a spirit. It's a mentality. It's a perspective that if you were there in his day, you'd have done the same thing. What he's saying is you're guilty. I looked up the son of Berechiah, Zechariah, the son of Berechiah, and looked up the situation. Guess what happened? They were all at the synagogue because that's what you do. You go to church. And the Spirit of the Lord came upon Zechariah. And he called them to the altar to repent and get their lives right before God. And they were like, hey, hot chop, mouth, loud mouth preacher, look. It's one thing we're at church. You ought to just be glad we're here. Trying to rule our lives and tell us what to do. So they stoned him and killed him. Why? Because God was saying, look, I don't want you to go to church. I want you to be the church. I want you at the altar. I want you broken before me. I want to restore your lives. I want to transform your lives. I don't want you coming and serving from a distance. I don't want you attending church. I want you to be my church. When he preached that out, they got offended and killed him for the message that he preached. But the message stays the same. Yes. They kill Stephen. Because he's speaking truth, but you can't quench out the truth. All you can do is kill the man. The truth's still here. Who's Jesus? The truth. They crucify him. What's God do? Raise him from the dead. Bummer. You just can't win. <laughs> so this is something he calls us into. I got to close. I got to finish. Make sure. Make sure that you're not in that list where you just get indignant in your heart. Where you're just a snap judgment person. You intellectually 
psychologically say, well, you're trying to control me and just get you to believe what I'm saying. No, no, no. What I'm saying is even if you disagree, don't let your heart be angry. It gives you away. Because if I am wrong, you should probably weep for me. Can you tell I actually believe I'm not wrong? And if I was wrong, you should cry for me if you actually know God. Now, if you don't know God, you'll just get mad at me. But see, it's a giveaway. See, isn't it amazing how quick it is to cry because of people? Your whole life, your whole life, and my whole life, we cried because of people instead of cried for them. Now, that's the difference, ain't it? When somebody did us wrong, that's all we held up high to all our friends and told them what they did wrong. Guess what love does? Covers a multitude of sin. Doesn't expose it. Doesn't exploit it. Doesn't parade it around. And Guess what love does? Cover. Guess what love does? Love gets on a cross, takes all the guilt of humanity upon itself and is made what men are so men can be made what he is. This is what love looks like. Forgive him, Father. He never sinned. Totally pure. God didn't curse his son. He put sin on his son. He made his son to be sin. He cursed sin in the flesh. So sin has no dominion over you. And he said, follow me. He didn't say sing to me, pray to me. He didn't say just pray a prayer to get a blessing. You follow me. You take of me. You eat of me. You learn of me. If you're heavy laden, if you're burdened, there's a reason. Your perspective's wrong. How about coming unto me? I'll give you rest. My yoke is easy. My burden is light. Because I'm not carrying the weight of self. I'm walking in love. I'm not burdened by what men are saying. I'm not burdened by what people think. I know who I am in him. And when you see me, you've seen the Father. Look, if you're heavy laden, how about throwing down that yoke and come unto me. I'll give you rest. And if you come unto me, deny yourself, pick up your cross, follow me. Yeah. It's the gospel. Yeah. Yeah. I think I'm going to. I think I'm going to do it. I think I'm going to be steady, Eddie. I've been saved 23 years. I'm passionate about this thing. I'm not 23 years and bored with it. It's a life-changing, eternal message, and I'm going to give him glory for it through my life for eternity. Because he wasn't a mere man and he didn't lose sight of what I was created to be just because I did wrong. He said, you're more than that, son. And I ain't losing sight of what you're created for. So he shed his own blood to prove a point that he's serious and paid the price to forgive me to get his life back inside of me. Come on, that's a big deal. And we turn it into theology and doctrine and circles. Uh, Churches on every corner, really, because we can't agree. And it's really doctrinally that we can't agree, but I'll bet you everybody can agree and become in love that Jesus was love. So why don't we throw all that other stuff aside just for a second and let's pursue the main thing and start becoming love. First Timothy 1 5. I found this stuff, man. Somebody shouldn't have let me read this book. I read it. I read it. It says the goal of our instruction. The purpose of the commandment is love. That means if you don't become love, you miss the whole point of why he came. And you pride yourself in your ministry. You pride yourself in your doctrine. You pride yourself in your circle, your seminary degree, your position, your title. Ah! And your heart doesn't love. And you're just fault-finding and criticizing? That's a scary thing. Do you realize Jesus was like not somewhat right? <laughs> that every day when he spoke in the streets, he's completely as right as you could ever be right. Who would agree? Amen. Who believes that he didn't even have a slant to what he said? It was just crackly clear truth. Right. And guess what? All men did when he stood there and spoke was listen for what they didn't agree with. And could never even hear what he said. To the tune of putting an innocent man on a cross being sure he was guilty. Forgive them, Father. They don't know what they're doing. 
Thank God, thank God, Jesus isn't like any of us. He's carrying the cross, analytical thinking, wait a minute, I can't take no more. Drops the cross halfway to Golgotha, playing into the hand of the enemy, loving his own life, just picking up a three-minute love of his own life. Are you kidding me, Father? Look what they're doing to me. I'm telling you, if they hit me with one more club. Yeah? He said to Pilate, if my, if, if, uh, it's, 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 no, no. If, if my fight was in this, I would send legions of angels. They would come. My father would dispatch. They would protect me. Oh, Jesus is amazing. Yeah. He's like, look, really, I'm a bad dude. <laughs> and if this wasn't the father's plan and you didn't have authority and power to do this, you wouldn't be doing nothing. It's the truth. I mean, Jesus. Ah! Could you imagine Jesus dropping the cross? Could you imagine just for a second, Jesus having a few issue moments? <laughs> you know, Father, I don't, I, I'm telling you, I'm just upset, man. I've been thinking all the way up this hill, dragging this cross. I know I'm the lamb slain before the foundation of the world. And I know I didn't totally know what I was going to walk into when I walked into the flesh and looked in their eyes. And we made them for their image, their sheep without shepherd. It's hard to bear. Sometimes I weep. I cry at Lazarus' tomb. All they can see is death. And I'm the author giver of life. They can't even see me. They just see death. They're ruled by it. Breaks my heart for them. But, you know, they have pushed me a little far today. I mean, Barabbas, are you kidding me? He kills a man, I raise the dead. He causes conspiracy. I'm trying to make a little peace here. And they want to release him and do this to me. I've just had about enough. If they didn't change by now, they're probably not going to change. And I don't really quite feel so rosy towards them right now. And I'm not thinking I'm going to go any farther. See, you never saw that attitude in him, did you? No. Did you ever see that in us? Yeah. Where'd we learn it if we didn't get it from him? If he's the teacher, we ought to learn from him. We ought to deny ourselves. Not live in rightness, live in righteousness. Rightness makes people wrong. Righteousness makes wrong people have the right to be right. Righteousness makes wrong things right. <sighs> so if I can't see it in his life, why would I want it in mine? Yes. People say, well, he couldn't have said what you said because he's Jesus. He couldn't say what I said because he's love. That's what makes him so incredible. And no one has ever left us like this. Amen. And now he empowered us to become the very same thing. And people, I'm telling you, playing for the 15th time. If we miss becoming love, we've done good church without becoming her. And we miss the whole point of why he came. That's what it means to be saved, delivered, healed, made whole kept safe and sound in the truth of why we're here through the shedding of his blood by the power of his spirit good enough yeah. Yeah. Oh, it's all good it's just the gospel now here's the deal yeah that's exactly how I feel now here's the deal. I appreciate all that but listen I'm not taking away from that at all. You guys are so sincere. You got to walk this out. It, it, there's nothing I preached that you individually can pursue by faith and start going after apart from any circumstance or person in your life. You can't say, well, you don't know what I'm living with at home when I just told you who's living in you all the time. Because if God said to you, that he was done living with you when you were in obstinance. You'd have no hope. Well, you don't know what they did to me. Well, if God said you don't know what they did to me, to us, we're done. And if he made us in his image and he wants us to model his image and if we forgive, they'll know forgiveness, then we probably ought to walk like he walked. 
I have scriptural proof. It's 1 John chapter 2. It's amazing. People say, well, that was Jesus. Well, read your Bible. Any man that says he abides in him ought to walk even as he walked. Why? Because he's not talking about God. He's talking about a man empowered by God. And that's what we miss all the time. So we can't even preach the gospel that's written because we lord our own human experience above his word. He said, any man that says he abides in him, 1 John 2, ought to walk even as he walked. Yeah. It says, if he loved us this way, ought we not love one another? So you in this, you got to ask yourself, am I in this for what I can get from him? Or am I in this to become more like him? Because depending on your answer depends what you'll walk in and what you'll enjoy. Because if you're just in this to get something from him, you're probably living up and down. You're not steady, Eddie. No, listen, there was a time in my life both my kids took off and were living on the wild side of things. And my, my wife was in identity crisis and I'm traveling the country preaching identity. And had no voice in her life because she believed a strong lie. Now that's reality. I wake up every day, not because I'm a hypocrite. My kids are living in compromise, so I'm a threat to them. So they won't even talk to me and didn't even want to be around me because I stood for something. So because they weren't going to live for that, I was a threat to that. So it was easier to avoid me. And my wife's living in an identity crisis and I can't even speak the truth. She just looks at me blank stared and says, you're supposed to tell me that. Doesn't mean it's true. So I'm pastoring full time and my own wife won't even come to church. And my two children are off in Neverland. That's when you find out what you understand and what you believe. That's why I carry myself the way I do. That's why I'm so intense. Because I was in those shoes. You weren't in my shoes. I was. And I woke up every day with Jesus, same purpose, same focus. And if my kids wouldn't, wouldn't want to hug me, I hugged everybody else's kids that would let me hug them. Why? Watch what I understand as a parent. Your children have no less value than mine. Stop coveting your children as if they're the most special things on the planet. Everybody costs the blood. They all have equal value. Your children are not less important than mine. And my children aren't more important than yours. They have inheritance through my life. There's a spiritual truth there. I get it. But God never told me to covet my children over yours. In fact, he told me unless I love less all these things I hold dear, I'll never be his disciple. And some of us are Christians for the well-being of the list he told us to love less. And we let personal tragedy hinder faith. Because we're Christians for well-being instead of transformation. And it's a dead giveaway when we respond in life to these things. Yes. Come on, that's just intense, strong preaching right there. Yes. Yes. Are you hearing? Are you okay? Yes. Let me pray something over you and we'll try to wrap this up. I'm sorry, I got late. I got late, I'm sorry. I don't know what time I got up here though. I probably didn't preach as long as I normally do. Because you guys took your time, which was good. It was good. I had fun being here. And you could tell I paid attention. Yeah. Couldn't you? Yeah. Ha. I'm not here just to preach. I participate. I took part. I enjoyed. You came in here early. I was sitting back here in the back, totally available. Who saw that? It's just me. I'm not here to be the guest speaker. I'm just part of the family. And he asked me to come because he felt like I had something to say. And I said, well, we'll come and see. So I came and I guess I had something to say. But people say to me all the time, man, that was clear. That was amazing. It's one thing if I preach clear. It's another thing if people want it and become it. It's a higher payday for a fellow like me. I didn't emphasize on the seed sowing thing. I'm going to talk about it tomorrow. I know I can feel it burning in my heart. And I got to quit because I'm so late. If you can come back tomorrow, come. If you can't, whoever's here will preach it. And if you're not here, we'll just preach it anyway. <laughs> but there's something about sowing a seed that's so powerful that you can't even measure. And it's a kingdom dynamic that gets missed all the time because we're always looking for fire and glory and, and power. And we miss the everyday sowing seed multiplied by as many faces as I'm looking at. 
I mean, this is an army. This is an army. It's really an army. If we start, if half of us get half of what we're going to talk about this weekend, it's going to have huge impact. I just know because it's the way we live. It's the way we teach to live. And I just know how it impacts. So, Father, I just thank you right now for your grace in this room. I just thank you for grace for change, that it's not works, it's not legalism, that there's no compulsion or obligation here. It's just what we're created for. It's your goodness calling us back, your goodness leading us to repentance, Jesus coming and dying because you never lost sight of what you made men to be. And no matter how far we ran and lived from that truth, you paid a price to bring us right back to that first day with you. I thank you that sin can't change that. The devil can't change that. Just us failing to receive it is the only thing that could change that. But in the end, we'll find that even if we were unfaithful, you remained the same. Don't let one of us find that out in a painful way. Don't let one of us stand before you and go, oops. Let everyone in this room be touched by the conviction of the Lord to where the word of the Lord and the truth of your word brings revelation to our lives so no one's surprised on that day. But let us have boldness in the day of judgment because as he is, so are we in this world. So I ask for grace today to walk in love, live by the Spirit, and see others through your eyes. And I thank you for it. Okay. And I ask for grace in homes, in marriages, to bring healing and restoration and no matter where a family was before this night. I thank you. It can find a place of change. I thank you that you rekindle hearts. You change perspectives. Take off the blinders, the unresolved conflicts, the layers, and let our eyes see one another clear through your love. I thank you we're not waiting on each other. We're privileged to become. Let everyone seize the moment we're in, Lord. And let everyone live and walk in a manner worthy of you. In Jesus' name. Amen? Amen. 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 Yay. Okay.